Penn State was had an open practice on Wednesday night. Blue White Illustrated was there to get the sights and sounds, which we'll bring to you today. But that's not the main event, believe it or not, because you are the main event. It's Thursday, which means it's our mailbag show for the BWI Daily Edition. I always maybe fib a little bit in the opening for the BWI Daily. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr, because the, the real main event, the real star is senior editor Nate Bauer, who joins us oh, every Thursday stop. for the, our mailbag show. Nate, how you doing? Well, now I'm blushing, <laughs> but other than that, I'm great. How are you? Uh, I'm great. It's always good to have some more information, a little bit more to go on when we answer these questions from Penn State football fans. And another day. <laughs> More information from James Franklin, his comments, talked to a couple of players afterwards, and of course, what we got to see ourselves. So we'll take the first 10 minutes or so of the show to discuss that. So what did James Franklin say to you that was interesting yesterday? Well, he said it to all of us, first of all, nothing, nothing directly to <laughs> me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, look, like I think that my major takeaway, and I wrote about this obviously last night, was just that the the youth movement that we have been talking about since really i mean clearly there were the the 10 early enrollees in january but you know i i would say since may right when when the the rest the second half of the class started to come in and started yeah. to test and we talked about how well in, you know all of those guys were doing from that perspective right physically a lot of these guys are ready. A lot of these guys yeah. are, are are at a level where they can realistically make a contribution to, to Penn State this season. And obviously those are on, on different levels. Some guys might be starters and some guys might be role players and depth guys or, or even special teams guys. But yeah. by and large, you're talking about a class as a whole that just really has an opportunity to contribute from the get-go. And last night, was a, a, just a further confirmation of that, right? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about Katron Allen and Nick Singleton at running back. I mean, the question uh, about those two guys was specific to uh, a, a viral video, right? a video that was released in-house from Penn State yeah. that showed both of those guys breaking off these long runs, Katron Allen's uh, running over poor M uh, Mackay Flowers. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, you know, just... just uh, it, this highlight reel that included a lot of those two guys. But beyond yep. that, uh, deny Dennis Sutton and, and yep. some of the positive things that he's done. I mean, I just think in general, um, you know, that that's kind of the undertone uh, throughout this preseason is just, look, there are a ton of names that everyone recognizes that will be back and will play a big role for Penn State this year. Take Brown, Sean Clifford, PJ Mustafer. Absolutely. But th there's also this this push from behind of these new guys who are not only ready physically, but they're they're taking that next step this preseason. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I thought I thought I thought those were kind of the big takeaways with the caveat of saying from the top that some of those guys hit a learning wall. Yes. Yeah. He, he said they were with the installation of the new. Uh, parts of the defense and parts of the offense, they kind of hit a wall mentally, which then you start to see some of the cracks, some of the mistakes. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's to be expected. He did emphasize it was the young players that he's talking about. And that doesn't even mean just the true freshmen that can yeah. mean, you know, red shirt freshmen and some guys that have uh, maybe are, are moving into a bigger role in the second year or whatever. Right. Yeah. That was an interesting comment. The thing that I was, I was, interested in knowing is we never really followed up with James Franklin after he talked about Mitchell Tinsley in the spring. Where is he physically? Has he progressed the way that Penn State wanted him to? Because that was something Franklin offered free of charge. Like we didn't have to ask how is Tinsley doing physically? And he, when we asked about him, brought that part up and he did say that the summer was great for him. He's exactly where they want him to be. And all of those testing numbers looked good. So he has the chance to be Productive this year, which is a, yep. a really positive sign for the Nittany Lions, kind of cleaning up some of those questions that we had coming into camp, which I brought up here on the daily, you know, a week or two ago, maybe. The other yep. thing that I thought was interesting that I was paying attention to, and you can check out the highlight video 
on our YouTube channel, Blue White Illustrated on YouTube, or you can search Penn State Football, was I was paying attention to the defensive and the offensive line and wanted to see especially where Adisa Isaac and PJ Mustafer were physically. And while we never really get to see full contact, we never get to see the actual parts of practice where practice is happening. We get to see the warm up drills and, and positional fundamental stuff, which for me is still interesting because I, you know, I can see, Ooh, that guy is really stiff. He's not playing and he looks really good playing with that pad level. But Adisa Isaac, one of the things watching him go through bag drills, explosive feet you know there there does not seem to be any lingering holdover from that achilles injury and that was a bit another thing i wanted crossed off the list how is he doing physically now pj going through the same drill looked like a, a nose tackle going through that particular drill but you know as far as turning and cutting and moving looked like a fluid athlete so um all very encouraging signs for penn state uh with those two guys and then you know you mentioned denied dennis sutton watching him do the drills just he just looks good. Like yep. that's always the thing too, is he looks so good doing everything that even if, you know, it doesn't live up to that immediately, you, you assume it's going to, cause he just, he looks good. He looks yep. like the type of person doing the thing that will be good at that thing. Yeah. Now I, it's, it's funny because I, I don't know actually how I feel about overall outlook after last night because to, to me it, it worked in two ways both to the positive and to the negative because that that physical present like if you just have better athletes if you have guys who are i mean no other way to say it better right uh yep. your team is in is in an improved position to succeed i just think that it's offset a little bit if if there's this ascension right of in this push of the younger classes whether that's true freshmen or even redshirt freshmen true yeah. sophomores guys who have played last season we're talking about Jalen Reed and Zaki Wheatley and um I, I mean Landon really Tangwall. all Lennon Tangwall all over the place uh, Nick Singleton yeah. what what have you right Harrison Wallace you're correct you're you're you are making a trade though that it, because it, it is the rare case of players who don't experience that learning wall that Franklin talked about. And so yeah. I'm just, yeah. in, I, in my mind, I'm trying to balance, um, you know, what, what he's actually saying, right. Reading between the lines and saying, okay, well, does that make them susceptible to costlier mistakes or yeah. more mistakes than they might otherwise be? If these guys are in these positions in prominent roles, as yeah. opposed to maybe having, less explosiveness or less playmaking, what have you, right. with players who do know the playbook inside yeah. and out and do so, have more of an instinctive feel uh, for what needs to be done at all times. I'm glad you brought that up because one of the questions I wanted to ask, but, and, you know, this is free of charge. I'm going to ask it later, but maybe a little bit too early to project towards Purdue. But if you if you go back to our conversation yesterday on the BWI Daily, which is the audio only version, an exclusive conversation where we were breaking down Purdue's offense. One of the things I brought up was you can't make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Purdue is going to take advantage of poor play and mistakes because they are a very buttoned up team with an experienced quarterback that'll go hit those passes if you're a defensive back. And if you're not getting there as a pass rusher because you're making mistakes, that's also a problem. So. Does that change how you want to install stuff? Does yep. that change your timeline for some of these players knowing that particular opponent is week one instead of an FCS opponent, maybe yep. a different team that's also starting new players? Uh, you know, if it were, you know, a different Big Ten team than, a, than one that has the profile of a dangerous night game against an offense last year that while it didn't put up a ton of points was very effective for good stretches of the season. So, that's something that I, I picked up on as well. I mean, do sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I don't. I don't think it's an accident that James Franklin keeps saying whether it's week one or week four, right? Right. Because there is a significant difference between <laughs> Purdue and week one, even Ohio and Auburn. Yep. Obviously, you got those three first games, but then yep. week four is Central Michigan, then yep. Northwestern, and then you get Michigan after a bye week. So. Like that's just the it's just the a, a very stark contrast in the quality of opponent and it's uh, again these these are just 
balances and questions that they're going to have to ask themselves, which are, hey, do, do you need to not make mistakes to beat Purdue and Auburn? Or do you need the most talent that you can possibly have? Because right. they might not they might not be aligned at, at yeah. that point in the season. The where, timing, the, the, or, the timing of all these things and the team that it is their week one may be different than the team that evolves later in the season. Right. Yeah. So anyway, you were saying. Uh, I was just going to say, was there any uh, last thing before we get to our mailbag that stood out to you or what you talked about with Tig Brown? I know that that was something that, you know, I'm eager to learn because I, I was not over there with that conversation. I was talking to Phil Troutwine. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually writing about it for this afternoon. Um, he, he look like he, he's obviously not going to give any state secrets, right, in terms of who is leading the, the charge uh, to start opposite him, um, you know. And also didn't really provide any insight in terms of, hey, is your job impacted in terms of where you are on the field, whether that's left and right, boundary yeah. uh, to the field, what have you, by based by who that is, right? Uh, whether it's Wheatley or Jalen Reed or Keaton Ellis. And he said very nice things about all of them. But, 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 but the thing that stood out to me was just a continuation of what Anthony Poindexter was talking about over the weekend, which is very simply that, Hey, uh, the, the ease and the confidence with which Tig Brown carries himself and handles himself yeah. on and off the field right now, it is critical to be able to instill that same level from his teammates. And so he yeah. talked about how he's trying to, to bring that along for not just the safeties, but throughout the defense, right. To, to, to be able to get everyone that is on the younger side of things that has a harder time playing instinctively what, because they're thinking about the playbook. They're thinking about yep. where do I need to be? When do yep. I need to be there? What's the technique for this moment? I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. I, it's a, it's a lot joke, of stuff. I joked with you after uh, James Franklin talked about that with the offensive line. Cause he mentioned like being in year two, if you're thinking about your job and not thinking yeah. about the defense, it, it's over after the snap because they're executing at a high rate. They're fast. They're explosive. You can't have any hesitation. And uh, I joked to you. I'm like, is he listening to the show? Cause we, we talked about that. Yeah. That's like the exact wording that we used uh, when talking about the offense a couple weeks ago. So interesting that that is kind of the, the overarching. You get that from the players and the coaches of knowing your job and how much better it is, you know, how much what we call instincts yeah. boils down to. I know exactly what I'm doing so I can predict what somebody else is about to do. Yep. Yep. I'm with you. Let's get let's get to it. Let's get to the mailbag. BWI mailbag is officially open. If you want to get a question on the mailbag show, the best way is to get to the BWI mailbag thread, which is at bluewhiteillustrated.com on the Lions Den message form. You sign up for one dollar and you get 12 months of access to not just not just the BWI mailbag, which is, I mean, like a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but also, you know, whatever Nate does is inside information that makes the world spin or whatever Ryan's doing with recruiting and the future of the program or whatever breaking news Greg has about the important comings and goings. But really, you get to the mailbag and uh, you put your question in and then we'll get it. And the ones that I can actually answer on air, we'll answer those on air. Uh, and then we take a select few from Twitter as well. But let's get to it. And actually... I lied. Before we get to it, I want to do something, and I want to make sure I get it away out of the way first because it's important. I want to say thank you to our channel sponsors on YouTube, people who have donated to the channel and have enriched our experience here and kept me employed. So I just want to say thank you to Stephen Light, John Johnstone, M. Shive 2, M. Scat, who is always... He's always here watching the show when it airs at 3 p.m. on YouTube. So if you want to check out the you, if you're listening to the podcast or if you're watching this on replay, it airs 3 p.m. on YouTube and uh, you can hang out with them. Scott, you could talk in uh, with David in in the uh, in the message thread there and watch the show. And of course, Peter White, who also donated the channel. So thank you, guys. Appreciate you all. OK, so let's get to our first question, which comes from uh, a couple different places about the same thing. And it's those young running backs. But 
It's not Nick Singleton. Jay Klee uh, 717 says, maybe I'm wrong, but not much mention of Catron Allen so far. I think he could be an absolute stud in short yardage distance. Might be hard to stop third and two. Uh, and then Cali Lion asks more succinctly, is Catron Allen fast now? So, Nate, are we are we sleeping on Catron Allen? Uh, you know, respectfully, and I'm I'm not. Um, I don't think we have. I mean, I no. think we've been I think we've been talking about Catron Allen quite a bit. Um, yep. You know, and and is is there maybe a a slight gap in terms of what I anticipate Nick Singleton can do from an explosiveness standpoint? Sure, right. maybe maybe a little. But I, I mean, I think that we've taken pains to say that Katron Allen has very, very, very much been a part of the buzz about yeah. that room really since his arrival on campus. I mean, I, I, I think that certainly through the spring, that was the case. And then even into the summer, I think that you saw that. And so it, it's yes, th there's always this balance to be had of the hype train running away. Right. Yep. And that it's just Nick Singleton all the time. Uh, I don't want to see that, but I also don't want to see the reverse, which is, I think what happens after a clip like yesterday comes out yeah. is now it's like, Oh my goodness. Katron Allen. What, this, <laughs> this guy's the best thing ever. He's yeah. really good. He is yep. really good. And yep. in combination with Nick Singleton, Nick Singleton is really good. Both of those guys have flaws, yes, that are part of being youthful. Mm -hmm. um, but as James Franklin said yesterday, and I thought that this was really important, it's the last thing he said, was that they have earned the respect that they get throughout the program. Okay. Yeah. And when he says that, uh, it, it, I, it, raises a little bit of an antenna for me because that means to me that they have done all of the necessary preparation yep. things, all the little things, all the veteran moves of studying and being where you need to be and showing up on time and you know, all that stuff, all of that stuff, acting like a pro treating yeah. it like a pro um, and just handling your business because there are yeah. a ton of guys, just about everybody that makes it at this level that gets to this level has the physical tools in some capacity yep. To, yep. to do spectacular things. That's just, they, they are, these are elite athletes, but yep. it's when you combine that and you package it and do all of the other things, but also make plays consistently. That's, that's the part. That's when that's you what... get that attention. And that's where these guys are at right now. Yeah. So you can flash and that's what you're talking about. A guy flashes is they can make a play, but to continually be there to earn the respect of people, not just for how hard you prepare, but then what you do when you're out there, you need to have both sides of it. And for young players, that's the part that usually comes last very rarely. And there are instances of these guys, right? They just don't try and they're just great at everything. Yep. You know, they're the superior athletes. There will be a time when that does catch up to them. But uh, for the most part, most players have to do both to consistently make plays, which gets you the respect because, you know, it's about the whole package. So let's get our next question. This is a perfect one for you. JC at VA is the Big Ten basketball, the biggest loser in this new TV contract. Seems that ESPN, a dominant force in college basketball coverage, Michigan State likely hurt even more. You're going to have to explain that last part to me. Why, why would that be, Nate? Uh, they're on ESPN a lot. They're on TV. Right. I mean, they, they're they kind of the marquee. Pro I think it's fair to say they're the marquee program of the Big Ten. So, so maybe yeah. that's where he's going with that. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess he has two questions there. Um, yeah. No, I, you know, look, uh, Fox Sports obviously has its own 24-hour network. Uh, CBS Sports has its own 24-hour network. Are they of mm -hmm. the profile of ESPN? No. Um, do they have the bulk of distribution channels that those do? No, but, um, I don't know. I, I, I haven't really thought of it. I haven't really thought of it that way because I is that going to be a streaming situation? So yeah, I mean, look, got... like, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was going to say, because you make a good point, there's no ESPNU, ESPN3, ESPN News to put these games on, but you're getting all these games in these other places. Does that mean we're going to see more games streamed? And that's kind of the exclusive location. If there's a marquee game on CBS or whatever channel is less known than CBS Sports or whatever it is. I don't know. It's been six yeah. different things. But anyway, I mean, is, is it all going to be Paramount Plus? Because that'd right. be awful. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't know, honestly. I mean, I, I it, it doesn't seem to me as though that's been really part of the conversation. I, I mean, obviously, everything with football kind of drives the bus on this. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I look uh, the Big Ten. I don't think will partner with media organizations that don't have the capability of distributing through various platforms, the product. Yeah. I, I mean, that's just, that's kind of the, the bottom end line result is... was thought of before they agreed to this deal of the, the function and the, the proof of what are you going to do? Tell us how you're going to do it. And then we'll sign. Yeah. And I mean, I, look, yeah. I think, I think that that has, um, I mean, certainly so many games, right. Uh, way more than are on ESPN are already on the big 10 network. So yes. Fox has that covered. Um, yeah. And then you add FS one or, you know, whatever Fox sports go, whatever their streaming platform is to that equation. I, I, I mean, I think that you're going to see a ton of that. Yes. But also, and maybe this changes things a little bit. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be any less, eyeballs on more big 10 cbs saturday sunday afternoon games or mm -hmm. fox proper right or nbc proper yeah uh, over over the air broadcast so i yeah. you know i, I don't no, know i think that there's the opportunity if you if you've got it on that main channel and i can pick it up with my digital antenna and i don't have to pay for espn like there's one less barrier but if it goes the other way i think that's to me interesting because there's a there are a lot of games. Second yeah. question here, and I, I don't really know. I don't know how to answer this, I guess. Who has more receptions this year? The running backs already out. Any two receivers combined, not named Keandre Lambert-Smith, Parker Washington, and Mitchell Tinsley. Uh, do you mean receivers specifically or receiving options? So, are we, are, so the top three, and then are we saying like Liam Clifford, Harrison Wallace, you know, as somebody there, or we, or can I throw in the tight ends? Yeah, but I think he's, the, the tight he, ends for sure. He's, I mean, he's asking about Keandre Lambert Smith though, right? He's saying is Keandre Lambert Smith going to finish the season with more receptions than the running backs combined or more than right. Uh, Malik mega and Harrison Wallace. The, yeah. That combination. Okay. And the answer is, All right. the answer is, uh, uh, hmm. So yeah, the, what do you, I, what do you have for, for Keandre? I, 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 mean, I, don't, I think don't think that, that I don't think they're throwing the running backs. out of it. Yeah. Neither no. do I. And so, I mean, I, I, you know, is like is Nick Singleton and I mean, that whole room, are they going to have thir like, I think 37 receptions for Keandre this year. Is that, yeah. So he was basically tied for third with the tight end room last year. So the question yeah. is, does the tight end room step up? Because that would be an opportunity for somebody else to take the receptions. But if it's not, Parker Washington, Mitchell Tinsley, and you're saying is it the younger guys? You're saying he's outright replaced at that point because that's where all those snaps would have to go. And there's three players that could do that. I'm still, I, I still am banking on Lambert Smith being the guy at that position. Yeah, um, I think that's the. So that's yeah, the, I'd say that's him. The, yeah, that's like that's the heart of the question is what's Keanu yeah. Lambert Smith going to do this year? And I, no, I think, I think he'll be productive. I, yeah. I do. And here's the thing is uh, the good news is for Penn State, if he's not, then there's somebody else that they can give it, give a go there. Yep. And there's a couple different options, but that should take the, I think that should take the pressure off. And hopefully in that environment, he'll go out and do what he does, which is catch bombs. That's I think really his role <laughs> in this offense is yeah. go out and get those, those big time plays where he's one-on-one, -on -one, he's got a great matchup and he just burns a guy. That's his job this year. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't anticipate him being 
a volume receiver the way no. that those other two guys are. I don't, well, I don't because, think because yeah, Washington and Tinsley are are ball magnets. Like they are going to get a lot of passes thrown their way. Those are the possession guys that have some some upside too. So you've got to make the most of your targets. I do see that, but yeah, uh, he's not going to be a volume guy for sure. All right, next one. Here's more about uh, <laughs> Keandre. <laughs> no, there's nothing about Keandre here. Another question about the Big Ten TV contract. Time to talk about the Big Ten TV contract. Noon kicks for big games. Um, so less of a chance for the big game whiteout. These would be resolved by Penn State and the athletic director scheduling big non-conference marquee games, Auburn, like they have this year, and putting the emphasis on the big game for out-of-conference games early in the season. Do you think that's a good idea, Nate? I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that it necessarily guarantees. Um, I, I don't know. It like these questions are challenges to me because I think that thinking about them the way things are is the wrong way to go about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I think that there will be any number like there's so many different balls moving at the same time. You, you can say, OK, well, what's going to happen with the Big Ten schedule? Right. Is the yeah. Big Ten is the Big Ten. If it turns into a super conference, is it going to turn? Is it going to stay at nine games or does yeah. the Big Ten say, hey, you know what? Uh, we might do even better with 10. Right. We're going right. to almost eliminate non-conference opponents okay that's mm. that's one side of things i think you have to think of things from penn state standpoint is pat craft going to schedule marquee home non-conference games right uh I, I mean i'm just gonna be blunt here i don't think that james franklin ever 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 wants to have a marquee an sec anything if you have a pulse he does not want to play you in the non-conference <laughs> schedule ever at again. home and definitely not away. Yeah. Definitely not away. A neutral site game, a one-off, fine. But yeah. that is yeah. not the path. Look, like it, these are facts. It is not the path to get into the playoff, to, to play any of those games. You don't need to. Beat your conference opponents and you can get there. So yep. that's, that's a second thing to consider. I mean, I just... I don't who's who's dictating who still gets the first choice there, because if it's a Penn State home game, I'm assuming it's still a Big Ten game. Right. Which right. there would still be rights involved. So it, it, right. I mean, it certainly seems to me as though Fox would still have first crack at those games. I, look like. Uh, right. Th there are so many bridges that need to be crossed between now and Penn State's so are future all, scheduling. Let me ask you this question. Are all games in the future, because this is something that, that Ryan and Greg talked about on the recruiting show on Tuesday, are all future games going to be at noon? Because that's what this is supposing, that all good games, all of yeah. them, yeah. are at noon. And none of them, no games at all, well, are going look, to be prime time. Is, is that also a, a reasonable thing as, as far as in-conference games? Is that a no. reasonable thing? No, because there's only one great conference game a year in the minds of Penn State fans as it is right I mean culturally Penn State thinks that Michigan or Ohio State and they obviously cycle between the two home and away uh those are the only two options for night games at right. Penn State outside of the annual whatever Georgia State Auburn yep. Um, you know, clearly Minnesota is going to take that role this year because of the noon slot. But I just, yeah, <clears throat> if you, if you look at a, a home slate, right. Seven games annually, it, it is very infrequent that Penn state fans have to guess which one is going to be a night game and, or a whiteout usually the two resolve themselves at the same time. And it's usually one of those two games. Yep. So no, I would say, I think what's going to happen is Penn state will shift its approach to whiteouts. Yeah. Right. To, to yep. having winnable whiteout games. Yes. That, yeah. that are earlier in the season that invite 
tons of recruits that can get there all day yeah. on Saturday. Here's another um, idea. Because it's just not going to happen on on it's, Michigan and Ohio State for Penn State yearly are going to be at noon. Here, here's another idea that I had just sitting here that I think would be a, a good idea for Penn State. Another, I'm just giving all all my good ideas away. Don't do it for free, T. Frank. Yeah, you got to charge. So here, yeah, well, so this is all contingent, and I can bring this up later because people forget in 30 minutes of words what I said, uh, <laughs> it, specifically in this situation. But you hold the whiteout, kind of like scheduling. You don't know 12 days in advance, in advance. So okay. let's say. You get through the season, and this is when, when Penn State in the future, in an optimistic future, where they're rolling and they're a, they are a top five team in the country every year. Woo. You hold the whiteout game for when you clinch the Big Ten championship. So it's kind of like the nail in the coffin of when you're playing Michigan State at the end of the year. You, are, you win that game, you're in the Big Ten championship, and bam, then it's the whiteout. And then it's, it's basically like it's over, right? So you've got your marquee matchup. Everyone's in a frenzy before the game, and then you shut down the season. You get into the Big Ten Championship game, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, that that would be my idea. Because the impact wouldn't – it's about, in my mind, keeping the, uh, the importance and the impact of that game. Now, that is dangerous because if you lose to Michigan and Ohio State early in the year, and then you have a Rutgers whiteout at the end of the season, uh, it doesn't feel as good either. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think, I mean, look, uh, I think there's also a feature where Michigan and Ohio state aren't in the same division as Penn state yeah. uh, in perpetuity. So, you know, like Michigan state, Michigan state never has even anything remotely close to the luster of Ohio state or Michigan in terms of an in-game atmosphere. And certainly you can argue that that has to do with the end of the season, but I think it has more yeah. to do with the respect of the opponent from Penn state fans minds. Yeah. So I, I just look, I, there's, there's just, there's it prognosticating right now feels foolhardy and it also feels fun. Um, not, well, no, I mean, I, <laughs> look, like I just, I just think that, that the way that we approach these things collectively, right. I'm saying like as yeah. a community and as the media and fans, what have you is we look at so much stuff right now through the lens of the way things have always been. And our, we fail to consider, all right, these rules are gone. Yeah. We, these, these things that these, these paradigms that we've had for forever are completely transformed they're going to continue to completely transform um you know and that's just that's just the way it's going to be you might have to yeah. you might have to get used to a whiteout at noon speaking right? of the whiteout speaking of scheduling and uh tickets to those oh games. boy oh boy love it yeah where can i are go you, to get them are you ready to watch me read on camera nate because yes. here we go have you been looking for a reliable source of Penn State football tickets Jim at TixmanJim.com, formerly PSUTixmanJim.com, has been running his ticket exchange in Wilmington, Delaware for over 25 years. Every buyer is handled with courtesy, respect, and every ticket purchased is guaranteed. Proceeds are used to fund the PSU AA Chapter Scholarship Fund and the PSU Levi Lamb Fund for athletic scholarships. Get your home opener, you your Ohio State stripe out because they're still the stripe out. Minnesota homecoming whiteout tickets. Speaking of the whiteout, go now to www.ticksmanjim.com or email jim at ticksmanjim at gmail.com. Call 302-521-8380. If you forget any of those things, look at the screen. Ticksmanjim.com is where you need to go. And uh, I'll give you his email again. Ticksmanjim at gmail.com. Nate, get your tickets. I'm ready. I'm ready to sign up and get those tickets. Let's go. All right. So let's get through a couple more of these. Beaverman72, regular here on the show. Uh, we discussed depth at safety and at the position. Are we underselling the loss of Brisker? Are we watching yes. the highlights from last year? Yep. He brought an extra gear, intelligence, prevented some big plays. I openly have a man crush on Jaquan. I told him to his face. He's the best DB I've seen play at Penn State. <laughs> Like, it, I, it, it was awkward. I saw it. I was there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, it was weird. It was weird. I, I regretted it immediately. Yeah. I just completely regretted it. 
But no, yeah. it was like he is. I think he's going to be a borderline star in the NFL because you're right. That speed, that explosiveness, uh, it created game changing moments. But at the same time, Tig was doing it, too. He was there. You know, they sometimes KJ Jefferson throws you the football for no reason. Right. And then sometimes you read Talia Tunga Valoa and you break on a ball from 10 yards deep and you get a pick six. So those six interceptions weren't all by luck. Like he is yep. also a very good football player. But when you don't have those two together, like the best defenses, and I know I'm going on about the Bills, but the Bills have a great defense because their safeties in that scheme are like, they, they just complement each other so well. They're so intelligent. They work so well together. And that's what you had at the college level with those two guys that, you know, from the same community college, they go through a same situation, you know, coming up from Lackawanna to Penn State. They have this clear bond and, and brotherhood, and they're both so smart on the football field and otherwise. Yes, that is going to be a problem, but that's on TIG then and on the young guys to continue that process, to continue to teach guys who have good talent at the roster. And again, Zaki Wheatley is very talented. I have yep. high expectations for him in the future. Jalen Reed, the same way. Uh, Keaton Ellis, he's got a really solid game. There, You can replicate, but you can't duplicate, I think, if, yeah. if I'm using those correctly. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that Anthony Poindexter said it. Right? Like, uh, I mean, uh, just to be as blunt as I can, I mean, asking him about that other safety sp spot, he, he, I'm paraphrasing, said, yeah, last year you looked on the back end of the defense and had no concerns. You just, yeah. you knew. You, you knew because there were two players back there who had extensive experience and they just, they communicated with each other. They did all of the things that make the engine run. And then on top of that, made plays yeah this year you don't have that same balance you don't you don't have that same dynamic between those two positions so i i do think for as much as take brown said on wednesday how confident he is in whatever direction that uh poindexter and obviously manny diaz decide to go in terms of filling that other spot with a consistent starter he said he's comfortable he said yeah. he's Right. It, that he has mm -hmm. complete confidence that they're all hungry and they all bring different things, but they all bring the same attitude and they write the same thirst to, to make plays. Yeah. Like that's that's all great. That's what you expect the leader to say. Uh, it, it's fine. However, if is if, that if, real? <laughs> no. Well, it's, the, it's not that if it's real or not, it's if if Anthony Poindexter is saying, hey, I got to get these guys going and yeah. I got to bring them along to match that same side because they do not have the collective same experience that Tig Brown yeah. has. And so yep. it's, it's about pushing. It's about getting those guys up to the same level so that you can feel comfortable with or without Tig Brown on the field. But and, I and do think it is like, that's a storyline that yeah. is not being talked about nearly enough. And they might end up having outstanding play there. I do think that the, the secondary is a strength of the team, yeah. but there, there are mistakes uh, to be had yeah. If they don't, if they don't make, I've that asked, process. I've asked Manny Diaz. I've asked James Franklin. You've asked Anthony Poindexter and all the coaches say we're building what we know about that group. We're laying the foundation. None of them have uh, given us the, given the confirmation of, yeah, they're going to, we, we see it, but like we need to see it. So I think that's a very fair way to, uh, to kind of address that group as a whole, even though very excited about some of those players in that, in that, you know, in that group as a whole. Yep. So let's move on to our next question. Uh, Losi's mustache is back. He oh says, boy. so James Franklin has talked about the middle linebacker competition between Tyler Elsden and Kobe King. But since Losi's mustache <laughs> has seen Elsden at times with an old school neck roll. Yeah. Do you think if he grew a mustache, then he automatically wins the competition? Nate. Um, I mean, he's going to win the competition either way. Okay. So with I or without thoughts. a, yeah, with or without a mustache, I think that uh, if, if we're taking bets at the window, uh, Tyler Elston, Nate Bauer, put his money down. So look, you can grow the mustache 
for sure that can be a way to go. But for some reason, I've been coming across lately, and I think this is Penn State fans on the message board, uh, yearning for yesteryear, throwing up pictures of Conlon and Dan Connor and Sean Lee, uh, you know, those players, and they all had buzz cuts. So if Elsden has the neck roll and a buzz cut, I, I think yeah. that's also a path towards what you're going for here. So that's another thing. Just absolutely no definition in your man, your your male grooming or extra definition. One I'm, of two ways, but not in the middle. I am staunchly anti mustache. Just for the record, I it might be jealousy. I don't know. But it's, so I I have always wanted to try a mustache, but one they're infuriating and they take too much work. Secondly, um, it doesn't. It's not even. So you would see exactly how lopsided my mouth is. I just, if I, I, I mean, I, I look at you. I don't, e I don't even understand how you live like that. I just like, <laughs> I can't imagine having a pelt of so, fur on my face. It, uh, first off, this is the, fathom it. this is the best version of my face. My face does not look good without said beard. Secondarily, you don't understand how advantageous it is. In the in terms of male female gender, I'm wearing makeup right now. Like mm. my beard is makeup, so mm. I'm on camera every single day. I don't have to do anything. I just have to make sure the lines are straight and we're good. Like you know, there's the technically things I should do, but like there's no problem with acne. There's no problem with like ingrown hairs from shaving all the time. The beard is the ultimate move if you want to just not worry about what your face looks like as long as you keep it maintained. The, my the, the viewership is just plummeting. It's just it's just fleeing. <laughs> I, I think my male grooming tips are helpful. You know, like this. I, I, I am more than just a football analyst, Nate. There is depth to my character. Anyway, Lands asks, although acting probably not one of them, despite what I thought about myself in my younger years. Curious as what you have charted with Diaz's defense. Ascent, uh, essentially, this is a four-two-five defense. What sub packages does he typically run? How frequently has he counter heavy personnel? Twelve twenty-one. Um, so I went and I did a little bit of research on this before the show, and he oh. runs the same defense. Just you know, like he runs the base personnel. That's the point of base personnel is you run base personnel. So there's no countering with heavy fronts against heavy fronts because the point is. We can stop the run with numbers. We don't like the, the Sam linebacker is the Sam linebacker. And it is uh, expected to be solid in run defense. And you're expected to be in your gap and win your gap. It doesn't matter if you're 210 or 235, 240, 290 pounds. Win your gap. Um, the, the sub packages come in coverage because that is where you have more flexibility. And that is where you need to have different skill sets out there because good quarterbacks can take advantage of guys that are not up to that level. So what we saw last year was a lot of safeties instead of linebackers. So you've got three safeties. Sometimes you got four safeties. And if that striker is a guy you feel comfortable with on third down, then you are able to play very uh, homogenous coverages. You don't know what's coming next. You don't know who's blitzing. You don't know who's dropping to a deep third. You don't know who's filling in the at. Like you can disguise more there than if you bring another big body on the field and they have a very specific skill set. So no, there there is no countering against the run. It is you play your gap, you win your gap. We're playing. We're staying in here till we get what we want on third down. Then we'll put in our sub packages. That's how I describe what I've seen. Now new talent. Better other talent, like does Abdul Carter have a package? Maybe, you know, maybe that's the, the case this year. But from what I've seen previously, he recruited a lot of safeties. They played a lot of safeties. Philip in the Valley. Can you explain the intricacies of, here we go, of the striker position and how Manny deploys it in uh, relation to the Sam linebacker, what PSU calls the star and a nickelback? Will the striker be replaced by a slot corner when going into nickel coverage? Are there situations we can expect expect to see both on the field. So that's, that's a lot like that's kind of what we just covered. So let's get into the, the other side of that. Um, Nate, do you want to here? I'll do this. No, yeah. <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm, I'm going on, no. going yeah, on and go on get and lunch. On <laughs> so the, uh, the striker position and the Sam linebacker are the same player. Like that is just a different 
nomenclature for the same position. And I'm borrowing what was on the depth chart for Manny Diaz at Miami last season. He called it the Sam linebacker when we talked to him recently. So vis-a-vis, it's the same position. It's just a... Di- I've been emphasizing it to emphasize the different player and where you're drawing that different player from. It is not going to be Jamari Budden. It is not going to be Abdul Carter. It is going to be a safety type player. That's why I've been emphasizing that. So it's, it's basically the star and the Sam have kind of combined into one player, but the star was essentially a third down ish package, right? So it is a player that comes in and plays that position on third down, which if you choose a nickel player, if you choose a slot corner, probably can call them the same thing. And that's why, Nate, I've simplified this to talk about it as the 11th defender. To cut through the BS, you've got 10 guys that play regularly, two defensive tackles, two defensive ends, uh, a will linebacker, a Mike linebacker, two boundary corners, a field and a strong safety. Then you have whoever fits best at that 11th spot, that field backer, You're taking care of that part where the offense in college has an advantage of all that green grass. Who are you putting there? And what down and distance determines what player that is? I'll buy it. I'm in. (laughs) Now, does Penn State have a different definition of star and nickel corner? I, I genuinely, I couldn't tell you that. Like, I don't know that specifically. I've not asked that directly. But it, it's about that player. Well, that they're not going to call. They don't call Daquan Hardy the star, do they? No, no. So that's a good point. Lamont Wade was the star because he was a safety playing that position. John Reed, they called the star at one point, and he was a corner, boundary corner playing that position. But you can call that a nickel corner. So I, that's where, I, you know, I don't want to I don't want to say anything with authority because I haven't exactly asked for the detailed description from Brent Pry about the difference between, you know, kind of a subtle difference between what's your star, what's your nickel corner. That makes I can't sense. believe they don't let you in on the meetings. I they should. I, I mean, know. come on. Every I time know. every time they say I'm like, I said that yesterday. You'll, anyway. You'll be quiet in the back. It's fine. Yeah. Well, if it's anything like class, I will not be able to keep my mouth shut. I am one of those annoying know-it-alls. Anyway, Penn State 2012. Speaking of uh, n- n- next question, I was going to say speaking of school because that's when I, <laughs> that's when I graduated. So I was like, speaking of school, Penn State 2012, good year to graduate. Uh, if if Wormley is penciled in as a starter, Salim Wormley, um, would Hunter Norzad be battling with Wormley or Lennon Tangwall for a position? Nate, you have been the expert on this particular yeah. conversation, so give us the information for Penn State 2012. Uh, yes. It's not battling. It's, I mean, look, I I feel uh, 93% confident that Landon Tagwall is going to be the starting left guard for the duration of the season. I don't see them moving him, right? Like, I don't think that that's what they want to do. They want to lock him in and get him focused on one position so that he can do it well. Uh, I think that the battle remains for Hunter Norzad with Sal Wormley, but that doesn't mean that he can't spell Tangwall at left guard. And it doesn't mean, honestly, because they, I mean, he brought it up. Uh, Phil Troutwine brought it up on Saturday that Norzad has practiced at all three of those interior positions on the offensive yeah. line. So yeah. I, I would not be surprised if Norzad, now look, like the center. Uh, actually, to be honest with you, I mean, it's across the board. Like most starting offensive linemen play an overwhelming percentage of the snaps. Yeah. But, yeah. but I think that that would be a luxury for Penn State to have that they would like to have that extra piece to be able to, to rotate in there. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a series here, maybe it's a series there. And then maybe Hunter Norris had, is so good or gets good enough uh, and knows it well enough and is able enough against the competition that he's facing in the big 10 to, to get in there and be more of a, a, you know, a bigger part of the conversation. But I I don't, I don't see that. Like what's the best. Can I ask you this? What is the best lineup for what is the ideal left to right for Penn state? Is it Fashanu, Tangwall, 
Scruggs, Norzad, Wallace? Or is it some other combination, do you think, of the highest potential and everything hits right for this group? What would you say? <sighs> well, I can't I can't discount Wormley. <laughs> Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, if the guy has the job right now, if he is penciled in as the starter and that job has not been taken from him very clearly. And I, I mean, I reported it, you know, kind of halfway or towards the end of the first week of camp, like Wormley's playing well. <laughs> he's yeah. doing really good things. He knows the playbook. He knows what he's doing. And it physically, I think to me, that's the, the thing that speaks the, the loudest is whether he's the starter, whether he finishes this season as the starter or not that that's uh, secondary to the notion that he's back from this injury he's able yeah. to play he's able to perform at a level that Penn State's able to feel comfortable with so yeah we're gonna see we're gonna see but yeah I mean I I, I, I just I can't I, I can't this, pick right now between those two guys the reason I ask this is because when I watched Hunter Norris at Unfilm, and this is kind of going back into probably my initial impression biases he's playing right tackle at Cornell obviously a different level of competition but when I watched him I thought and I knew Iowa was interested in Norzad and to me that said center you know given what they were losing but also just his skill set what I think of his skill set so that's why I want to know like what is the best possible combination because it should all be open we're talking about Juice Scruggs as if he's the presumed locked in starter which is how everyone is operating I'm not saying that we're doing that wrong yeah but if the point of this whole thing is depth and competition it's not depth and competition at right guard it's depth and competition at left center right and yeah. if that is not the case if that's not the case, then I think that there's still a problem where if Juice Scruggs is struggling with the transition to center and he's not performing at that level and you feel like Hunter Norzad gives you an opportunity to upgrade, you've got to make that hard call. Like that has to happen this year. That's the yeah. point of all these players on the interior where you didn't have that last year and you felt like those two guys that you had on the interior, those three guys were the only ones that were going to really work. That can't happen this year. I just, I just haven't seen anything literally anything to suggest that Penn State isn't thrilled slash pleased with Jeff yeah. Scruggs so yes I'm throwing I, out a hypothetical this is a yeah. this is a purely a hypothetical of and you didn't put Landon Tangwell in there as well I yeah. love his potential I don't think he should ever move from left guard all the way to the end of his NFL career I'm I'm way too high on Landon Tangwell but if he doesn't perform yeah, that's the point of all that's this fair. depth we've talked about. That's fair. No, that's that's totally fair. That's totally fair. Uh, so this is from Scott Cavada on Twitter. Uh, I think we usually figure it takes a new offense coordinator four games to get into a groove with the offense and players. That combination, although, you know, shot it last year. Not sure that really ever happened last year. Should we expect the same learning curve for the defensive coordinator and his side? Or is it steeper? We talked a little bit about this this week. What do you think now that we're answering the question directly? Yeah, I don't, I don't know about what week it happens necessarily. It might not happen to the level that you would like. I mean, I think that the difference between year one and year two is always fairly pronounced. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that if you're listening and kind of taking bits and pieces of what everyone is saying, everyone's saying that. Every, yeah. Everyone is saying that through the offseason. I think Manny Diaz is saying it. I thought I think yesterday James Franklin said it about how you have to cater. Uh, you know who was it Saturday or was it yesterday? It doesn't matter. Uh, about about who has to do the learning. Is it the players or is it the defensive coordinator? And so what I think is the most realistic expectation is that what Manny Diaz loves to do and wants to do might be tempered somewhat. Now, granted, they're all, again, in the same vein as Brent Pry. He wouldn't be at Penn State if it wasn't. But I think that those, some of the, the more complex, the more nuanced aspects of what he wants to do defensively might have to be tempered a little bit this year so that the players who are, uh, you know, acclimating to it have the opportunity to, to play at their best. 
rather than being so, you know, tied in knots over exactly what to do when and how to do it and when to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's a good point. And that's riding that balance is going to determine, I think a lot of the early season for Penn state, especially, but then, you know, once you get into better opponents, are you caught up enough that you could do some of the stuff? And James Franklin said yesterday, some of the complicated things we're trying to do on offense and defense offense. You, you need to hit that this year. You need to hit, hit that gear this year. Defense. Yep. How, when can you hit that gear is the hope. So I think that that's a good way to put that. Poncho 570. Happy to see all the positive news regarding Hakeem Beeman, who you just saw here on the channel if you're watching. Only concern I have is weight against teams going to run the ball more than they pass. Do you think he'll be able to hold up, or is there enough quality depth at his position to mitigate that concern? I just don't know what to do, Nate, with the size conversation with Penn State defensive tackles, because he is an outlier even amongst that group, but they don't play two 300 pound players they don't have a nose they don't have a nose tackle even with pj mustafer in a true sense of like he lines up on the nose um so it seems to me manny diaz if you're 285 you're you're big enough and for some penn state fans unless you're 315 you're not big enough so with keen beeman but really this conversation about size and minnesota size and michigan I, I don't, where do you want to go with this, this time, I guess. I just, um, I, I mean, what about Zane Duran? What? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, 272. Um, yeah. no, nah, I don't, I don't, I just don't think that Penn state is necessarily fixated on that. And yeah, I, th I think, I mean, again, like I'm, I'm, I'm talking in generalities and just broader picture, but if, if Penn state is in ga games against teams that exclusively want to run the ball or ex play power football or what have you, yeah. uh, I think Penn state does not feel even with a lighter. Well, first of all, they still, they have the option of going left and right with, with Mustafa and whoever Ellie's yeah. right. I mean, yep. they, they, they can do that. They don't have to do uh, a, a, like a three tech that is lighter and specializes in, you know, getting into the backfield. Like they don't, yeah. they don't necessarily have to do that against those specific teams, but also more again, more broadly, it shouldn't matter. <laughs> it shouldn't matter right. because those teams that you're playing, Minnesota wants to score 20, one points and yeah if Ooh, you 28 if they're having a good day 28 is a big day yeah i just you know it goes back to illinois like it just it, yeah uh score points score points and it doesn't matter if you want to yeah. take if you want to take eight and a half minutes to drive 75 yards and settle for a field goal at the 12 yard line penn state will let you do that all day they will be they happy loved it when so. wisconsin did that that they loved it when wisconsin did that they didn't love it when they couldn't score themselves. Um, yeah, and here's the other thing, too, is Manny Diaz talked to you about creating negative plays. You know what those teams hate? Negative plays, because they have no recourse if yep. you're purely run. Let's talk about teams that are purely run. When, when Michigan, and I think this is a great example of a team that was purely run, and they had to throw the football, and the difference last year, yes, they had that great running game, but the quarterback was able to make timely throws. That's what got them over the hump in the third and fourth quarter is they hit those big pass plays. It wasn't that Hassan Haskins and Blake Corum were chewing up yards for touchdowns. Penn State held them in check. That's the formula for any team that plays like Penn State because Hakeem Beeman can, if you're big and strong and you're playing for one of those teams, you're probably not an NFL offensive lineman. You're probably not an All-American. There are a couple, but there's not five of them on the other side. So Hakeem Beeman is going to be quicker and more violent than that person at the initial contact because he's explosive. So he's going to get tackles for loss. Yep. Will he get pushed two or three yards down the field on a double team here or there? Probably. But does that equate out when he wins those plays and he makes the running back cut in the backfield and then you rally and tackle? That's the idea here is that if you have the guy that is both big and fast and explosive, then great. You're one of five schools, but otherwise, how are you going to choose to win? Because 
put this up here again. You know, it'll take too long. But PJ Mustafer is not as quick as Akeem Beeman going through drills in life anywhere. Well, maybe Mustafer, he's a pretty quick witted guy. But that's the reality. Zane Durant, those guys are quick. They yep. have an advantage over guys that are not quick, which are typically the guys that play for those other teams. If those other teams are performing better, they are getting the blocks they're supposed to. They're getting those reach blocks. And I, I'll just say it again. Penn State didn't lose because Ellie's was too small. Penn State lost because Ellie's kept getting reach blocked, which is a quickness factor. It is a first two steps factor. He was not winning the first two steps against Illinois. It had not to, it, very little to do with his size. Hakeem Beeman's not getting reached. So, you know, I, I there there are give and take, yes. But I think the pure number is a fixation that we all have, me too, that is not as important as how big you play. I mean, listen, there. as the, as the kids say, take them to church, T. Frank. <laughs> Well, we've got to wrap up church here pretty quickly because it's been an hour and the, you know, anytime you've been to church for something that's happened for over an hour, everyone starts to get restless in the back. So Psy yeah. Kim asks, many fans like me have no clue what to look for in the offensive line during a game uh, to give up a sack or a huge pressure. What do you look for in games that a typical fan can look for to see if the offensive lineman is doing his job well or not improving or not? So the main thing is to actually watch them most people watch the football. So if you can train yourself to watch what happens at the snap, you'll know what's going to happen before it happens. So let's say it is a second and seven. That is a very neutral down. You can throw, you can pass dealer's choice is the offense. Look at the offensive line and not just their stances, but like what happens at the snap. They'll tell you where the ball is going for the most part, whether they're pass blocking, whether they're run blocking. And to know the intricate details, you don't need to know the blocking schemes. You don't need to know the technique, but you do need to know and you do need to see what they're trying to do. And then you can determine from there if you want to talk to somebody like me or other offensive line coaches who are experts and they want to remind you that they're experts. Um, then you can go and get some of those more detailed conversations. But for the most part, average fans, if you actually watch the offensive line, it's fairly obvious. You'll see a dude fall on his face trying to get a block. You'll see a guy not be athletic or be very athletic and get to the second level. All of those things are kind of surface level obvious, and that's the best place to start, I'd say. Last right. question. Last question, Nate. I said you were going to talk more today. I think I held up to that, but not here at the end. Unfettered. Uh, <laughs> asked, am I crazy to think this is a deep and talented team with a host of experience for which we should have some high, if tempered, expectations? Nate, I've been riding that line this year. I've been riding Ooh. that line for this team. I like their your, their young talent. But yeah, I don't. I, where do you land on this? Yeah, I, well, it's just it's just the host of experience part of the comment. Because you can have a host of experience that isn't very good and yeah. a host of inexperience that is. And I think that's that's the balance. I, I, there's so many rabbit holes to go down, but yeah. how good is Sean Clifford going to be this season? Bottom yeah. line, how good is he going to be? How much help is yeah. he going to have? How much is... How much is that influx of talent in the running backs room going to change the dynamic of the offense? How how much? I, I mean, I, I could go on all day long. I yeah. just think that that question is the core of what this season is going to be, and I don't have an answer for it yet. I mean, I, yeah. I continue to be bullish on Penn State. I thought they, and people hate me for this, I thought they were good last year until they got hurt. They got hurt yeah. in a couple of spots that they couldn't afford to get hurt, particularly at the quarterback position after suffering a transfer the offseason prior. If that transfer doesn't happen, things are different. Yeah. I, I just, it is. And so, um, yeah, uh, can Penn State expect, like, have some excitement? Uh, and I don't know. I can't, I, I'm having trouble reading the fan base on this, but. My yeah. sense is that the last two years have ingrained a sense of doom or pessimism or what yeah. have you. Yeah. But I mean, I'm just trying to look at 
what this program is built to do. The injection of talent over the offseason, some of the losses that they experienced to the NFL, and pair all of that up against the schedule. And yep. when I look at all of those different factors and put them all together, I see a team that can possibly win double digit games. Like yep. I don't even hesitate to say that. I yep. see a team that also could have players in positions that lead to not necessarily some unexpected losses, but yeah, some some close game. I mean, I just I yeah. think that they're gonna have a lot of close games and proving the ability to win those games is is on a whole new set of players. They they haven't yep. done it yet. So it's all on them to be able to to kind of figure that out for the coaching staff to help them along in that process and then to go out and actually execute. I don't know what Michigan State brings to the table truthfully. You know, this yep. year is is their defense better? Uh what is what does it look like with all the transfers that they have? But like that one aside, you p- want to paint a good healthy picture and, you know, I'm feeling good today. Had a good day at work. Ate a good breakfast. We're having a great time. I'm in an optimistic mood. Good Sean Clifford and Nick Singleton working out. I think the only game that they lose is Ohio State. Like, that's a genuine, I don't know, even if that overcut, they can overcome uh, a potential Heisman candidate, maybe even yeah. two on the same team. Yeah. But I'm not bullish on Michigan. I had J.D. Uh, Piquel on the show, you know, a national analyst who is not, doesn't cover Penn State. He and I saw it the same way. Can you replicate having an elite defense and an elite offense that ran the ball and did everything but keep the quarterback good? Same thing with, does Penn State have that this year? Because that's how they're going to have to be. Uh, optimistically, I could see that. Pessimistically, yep. we're in the same spot. So yeah, I think you're right to have some tempered expectations, but not be totally negative. Um, so that'll do today for the BWI Daily Edition. Our mailbag is now closed. So think of some more questions. We'll be back next Thursday to give you more answers that hopefully satisfy you. Keep coming back, so it can't be that bad. Right, Nate? I mean, I we're getting comments. People are commenting, and I'm replying to every single one of them. So say <laughs> nice things. All right. We'll be back tomorrow. Wrap things up. We're taking a look at the class of 2024 for Penn State football. Ryan Snyder on Friday. We'll talk to you then.